I call this the usefulness of the pastons. And when I chose the title, I was thinking primarily of the usefulness of their letters um, for historians and the light they shed on so many aspects of late medieval society and politics. And that's my starting point today. But I also want to consider their usefulness within their own lifetimes and within the framework of their own society. What gives the letters their unique value? And they are, as we've just heard, recognised to be the best of the 15th century collections is the unusually high proportion between the pastons themselves, which lets us see family dynamics and relationships playing out in real time. They write, in many cases, for pleasure, easily and fluently, and at the risk of sounding a bit twee, um, we can hear their speech patterns. Most letter collections at this period are generally more formal in style, and they tend to be predominantly men writing to men. We hear much more from the Paston women than is usual in letter collections. And it's Margaret, the wife of John Wan, who is almost certainly the inspiration behind the gathering together of those letters. There are other collections, of course, um, which sometimes have letters by women. And although it isn't a Paston letter, um, I, I do rather cherish the letter from one of the Barclay women uh, in the 15th century. The Barclays were having a major lawsuit uh, with a rival family. And the wife of the male Barclay had gone to London to deal with the legal process there, taking her daughter with her. And she writes back to her husband to report um, success with the closing remark that he must not negotiate with the people um, in Worcestershire, but wait until she gets back, and then all things will be well, she said. <laughs> um, so it isn't only the past and women who are um, quite feisty. Of course, when I talk about women writing letters um, in this period, almost without exception, they are not writing them. I mean, they're not penning them. They have an amanuensis. And in some ways, I think we can find this slightly disconcerting. Two of the most famous Paston letters are those written by Marjorie Brews. And their love letters to John Paston III, the second of, of William's sons with that name. It is clearly her voice that we are hearing. I don't want to spend all my time uh, reading letters to you. It's terribly tempting. Um, and as some of you know, um, in the past I have run weekend courses at Maddingley Hall of seven lectures of one and a half hours each on the Pastons and have been able to wallow <laughs> in, in sharing these letters. But I do want, I, there are one or two I, I want to quote to you today, not an hour and a half's worth. Um, the Paston family had 
got as far as agreeing that the John Marjorie Paston marriage would be a good one. And then Marjorie's father cut up rough. He wasn't prepared to give as much money or much landed endowment to accompany the marriage as the Pastons wanted. And so the Pastons um, were calling a halt on the marriage. And Marjorie Bruce writes to John III in February. Right reverent and worshipful and my right well-beloved Valentine. Ladies note that right reverent and worshipful is the way to address your bloke. <laughs> I recommend me unto you full heartily, desiring to hear of your welfare, which I beseech almighty God long for to preserve unto his pleasure and your heart's desire. And if it please you to hear of my welfare, I am not in good health of body or of heart, nor shall be until I hear from you. My lady, my mother, has laboured the matter to my father full diligently, but she can no more get than you know of, for the which God knoweth I am full sorry. But if that you love me, as I trust verily that you do, you will not leave me therefore. For if that you had not half the livelihood that you have, for to do the greatest labour that any woman alive might, I would not forsake you. Now, that is actually penned by one of her father's servants. It is, I'm sure it is her voice, um, but she is not writing it, which to our way of thinking, with a letter of such intimacy, um, seems quite strange. I suppose for many of us who know the past in letters, it's these personal letters that are the gems of the collection. And as with that one from Marjorie, they do have or can have a real emotional value and another example, and in fact the only other one I want to do at any length, is again a um, problem over marriage. The Pastons have a, a very loyal family bailiff, I suppose you would call him, called Richard Cow. And he has fallen in love with Marjorie Paston, daughter of the house. And they have exchanged vows privately in the present tense. And for the medieval church, vows in the present tense, even if not witnessed, did make a binding marriage. Um, you have to use the present tense, and of course it's still there in the marriage ceremony. I so and so do take you to be my wedded wife. And they had done this, and they regarded themselves as married. Family didn't know, of course. And then Marjorie Paston loses her nerve, and she daren't tell her family. And Richard writes a long letter to her, and I'm not going to read all of it. And it's deeply, deeply moving. And... Part of the reason it's so moving is that he can't stop writing. He works himself up to a conclusion or sort of concluding statement and then he starts again. I'll give you a bit of it. My own lady and mistress and before God very true wife, I with heartful sorrowful recommend me unto you as he that cannot be merry nor shall be until it be otherwise than with us than it is yet. For this life that we lead now is neither pleasure to God nor to the world, considering the great bond of matrimony that is made between us. Wherefore, I beseech almighty God to comfort us as soon as it please him. For we that ought of very right to be most together are most asunder. It seems to me it is a thousand years since I spoke with you. I had rather than all the goods in the world I might be with you. 
Alas, alas, good lady, for little remember they what they do that keep us thus asunder. I understand, lady, you have had as much sorrow for me as any gentlewoman hath had in the world. I would God all that sorrow that you have had had rested on me, so that you had been discharged of it. For I know, lady, it is to me a death to hear that you have been treated otherwise. This is a painful life that we lead. I suppose if you tell them seriously the truth, they will not damn their souls for us. Therefore, though I tell them the truth, they will not believe me. And so it, so it continues. It's the, it's the warm past in letter that really makes you feel a voyeur when you're reading it. Um, the ending is a, a, a sort of happy one. Um, Marjorie does tell her, her mother about it. And mum and grandmother, William's widow, whiz Marjorie off before the Bishop of Norwich um, t for him to hear the case and um, decide whether it does make, make a marriage. And Mar Marjorie at this point gets her nerve back. This is a, an account from her mother. She, Marjorie, rehearsed what she had said and said if these words made it not sure, she said boldly that she would make it sure before she went thence. For she said she thought in her conscience she was bound, whatsoever the words were. These lewd words grieve me and her grandmother as much as all the rest. I pray you and require you that you take it not too heavily, for I wot right well it goeth goes right near your heart, and so it doth to mine and to other. But remember you, and so do we, that we have lost of her but a whore, and set it the less to heart. Um, okay. You can see why the letters are so, so addictive. Um, we also see parent-child relationships. And these two can have a ring of familiarity. Um, John I whinges about his eldest son, John II's lack of enterprise. He's lazy. He's living a, a, a life of relaxation. He's a drone among bees. Um, or we see John III stuck at home without employment with his widowed mother. Um, and he's desperate to find a job and get away from home. So the letters give us a real sense of personality. Really, for all the members of the family, we, we hear little about the younger children. Um, but the family do come alive. Um, Agnes Paston, William's widow, is clearly a very aggressive and cantankerous old lady. Um, she had, um, well, she had several children, but, but an unmarried daughter um, remained at home, and Agnes wanted her married, wanted her married to the right person, and beat her several times in the week, and sometimes twice in one day. Um, and when one of Agnes's younger sons went off to university, she um, sent word um, with him to one of her servants asking for who was, who was teaching him. And Agnes finishes her comments, and if he, Clement, the son, hath not done well, nor will not amend, pray him, the teacher, that he will truly be lash him till he will amend. And so did the last master and the best that ever he had at Cambridge. I may say as a teacher at Cambridge, I do not be lash. <laughs> Tempted, but, but don't do it. Whereas Margaret Paston, um, William Wan's wife, sorry, no, John Wan's wife, um, also writes a letter when one of her younger sons goes off to university, Oxford in this case, 
And what she writes about it is that he may be set in good and sound rule, so he may be under good governance. But she goes on, for I were loath to lose him, for I trust to have more joy of him than I have of them that be older. And also I pray you write a letter in my name to Walter, so that he do well, learn well, and be of good rule and disposition. There shall nothing fail him that I may help with, so that it be necessary to him. So those two women, uh, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, are, are chalk and cheese. I think reading the letters, we often feel a, a, a jolt of recognition. Although I am um, a bit resistant to the idea that medieval people are just like us, really. Um, in, in many ways, they're not. Um, but now and again, um, you see um, a shared interest. The letters also shed light on contemporary politics. They span the period of the Wars of the Roses, and many of the key protagonists in those wars crop up, um, often sending commands, um, or simply being the subject of news reports um, by one of the families. The most vivid and detailed account of a particular political episode is the account of the murder of William de la Pole, uh, Duke of Suffolk. De la Pole was uh, deeply unpopular in, in many circles and in Late, 40, late 1449, early 1450, um, Parliament ruled against him and demanded that he be sent into exile. And on his way into exile, he was, his boat was intercepted and he was murdered. And his body was thrown on Dover Sands for later collection. Now, the past an account of this is one of the most um, vivid that we have and the tone of it is actually quite interesting. The account begins, I am right sorry of that I shall say and have so washed this little bill with sorrowful tears that you shall scarcely read it. And you think, well, mm, can we take that at face value? And we get this very horrible description of the death. And then the letter concludes, um, what shall be done further, I wot not, but thus far it is. If the process be erroneous, let his counsel reverse it which is cryptic, but I think the drift of it is a rather gloating, let Suffolk get out of this one, um, which casts doubt on, on the sorrowful tears. Now, in many ways, the Pastons tend to be on the edge of the big events of the Wars of the Roses. They're good observers, um, but they're not necessarily up to their ears in it. John II fought for the Lancastrians at Barnet, and that may be something to do with the dispute over the Fastolf inheritance. <coughs> John III was summoned by the Duke of Norfolk, John Howard, to fight at Bosworth. But it's not clear whether he did. Um, we know the Norfolk retinue went to Bosworth um, because Norfolk himself was killed in the battle. But John III made his way to the Tudors really quite quickly. And Richard III clearly had problems getting his troops out at Bosworth. Um, as I say, Howard himself fought and was killed. We don't know about John. On the whole... 
as I've implied, the Pastons made their way in local politics, local politics rather than national. And it was those local connections which made them useful to others. And this goes to my second theme. Medieval society, not only political society, um, is a network of contacts and influence and favours, giving and receiving help and service. Now, when I talk about service, I'm not using it in a, in a menial sense. Um, serving a master um, is an honourable thing to do. Or to put it another and perhaps more honest way, this network of contacts is a matter of granting and cashing in favours. You do something to help somebody, they ask you to do something, you do it, they owe you. Um, so the Pastons are in the thick of, of this. William, who is the effective founder of the family's position, was legally trained, as we've heard, and he ended up as a judge. Now, this is a very legalistic age with apparently endless disputes over the possession of property. Um, medieval land law is an absolute can of worms. And of course, who benefits from that? Lawyers. Um, Colin Richmond, in, in his three-volume book on the Pastons, pointed out that one of the things Judge William specialised in, I, I'm exaggerating a bit and Colin exaggerated a bit, Judge William specialised in helping widows who were trying to keep a grip on the land that they were entitled to. And Judge William was very good at this and he often won um, the case. I mean, he's acting as lawyer here, not judge. Um, and the price of that was for the widows to make him his, their heir at law. So he got the land in the end for himself. Um, John Wan is also sent to study at the Inns of Court. He never formally practised law, but he advised people about it. And he became the man of business of Sir John Fastolf. John Wan later claimed, as, as we've already heard, that Fastolf bequeathed him his land on his deathbed and endless disputes ensued. John too doesn't become a lawyer. He tries his luck at the royal court, at the king's court. And initially, it's a complete disaster. And one of his uncles um, writes to John I, John II's father, to say that John II is not making his mark at court. And when he sits at the dining table in the household, the royal household, the servers do not serve him. And you sort of envisage this poor chap sitting at the end of a very, very long table with servers just walking past him and not putting anything in front of him. Um, he clearly perseveres because uh, in the later 60s, early 1470s, he is um, visibly in, in the royal circle. Um, and he has friends in high places. He's a bit of a playboy. Um, Paston letters include a number of rather enthusiastic um, claims by John II about 
assorted women. And he does indeed have a, an illegitimate child. He never marries. He has friends in high places, though, and the royal court was in many ways the place to see and be seen. John 2, John 3, sorry. <sighs> Talking John 1, John 2, and John 3 is a nightmare. In, incidentally, um, there have been various discussions of why um, in the Middle Ages, and possibly later, um, children of the same generation were given the same first name. Because, I mean, it is very odd. In the 19, 1970s, when psychohistory was, I know it sounds like Hitchcock, but it means writing history with, with psychology in mind, um, two explanations were offered, both of which I think were toggle. Um, one is that it was in case one of them died and you wanted one of them to have a name. Um, the, the other one, equally unlikely, is that parents weren't really bothered by their children anyway, so what did it matter? <laughs> um, I mean that. I mean, in the 1970s, there were historians, predominantly US historians, who were saying with absolutely straight faces that parental affection was a discovery of the 18th century, and that before that, parents were quite capable of not knowing who their children were and forgetting them. It's potty. Um, I, I, think, I think the real solution um, is that the, the usual tendency is that the godparent of the same generation, as same gender as the child, named it. Um, and I would imagine that the two Johns in the Paston family um, either means that the Pastons had two powerful patrons with the first name John, and of course Fastolf is a candidate for, for at least one. Um, you sometimes see this in other places. In um, mid-15th century Warwickshire, there were a lot of gentle families, gentlemen, called Richard. And I would bet Richard Beecham, Earl of Warwick, had stood godfather to at least some of them. And a priest called William left in his will gifts to every one of his godsons and they were all called William so you know um, I think it works like that now all the Pastons were in a position to be helpful to their social superiors and to act as patron to their inferiors the classic example or a classic example the letters are full of them Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, asks John I to show him, Richard Neville, his goodwill and favour about a recent land purchase. And the Earl of Warwick continued, and in the same matter to be my faithful friend, as my great trust is in you, wherein you shall do me a singular pleasure and cause me to be your good lord that very evocative 15th century phrase. It didn't mean John I was making a formal commitment to the Earl. He isn't the Earl's retainer. He isn't the Earl's man. John was simply making himself useful, as he did to all the local noblemen in East Anglia. In 1450, the Earl of Oxford, John de Vere, asked John I to make the Earl's apologies to the Duke of Norfolk and carry letters to two local gentry. In the eyes of the nobility, in the letters of the nobility, John I was their right, trusty, and well-beloved friend. On one occasion, the Earl of Oxford addressed John II as worshipful and with all my heart, right, entirely beloved. The Pastons or at least the elder boys among them, were, in the contemporary phrase, great men, 
quote, who could, who, sorry, I've, got, I've mispunctuated that. Great men would do for the Pastons, not in the modern sense, but in the positive sense. Warwick, Oxford, Norfolk would do. They would do things for the Pastons. And it gives the Paston status and it might bring more tangible rewards. Favour flowed the other way, from the Pastons downwards. John Ross, a Paston servant, employee, asked John Warren, describing him as his right honourable master, to secure him a port office in Yarmouth. He, Russ, offered to give John's son five marks yearly if Russ got it. But that's actually not usually how it works. Russ also pointed out if he got it, he, Russ, would be respected by the local merchants. And then he used a rather cryptic phrase, with whom and with all men I call myself a servant of yours, and so will do. And I think Russell's implication is that because John could get him that office, it has enhanced John's status. Um, now, this perhaps can all sound a bit cold-blooded and a bit self-seeking. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's an ambitious world where men jock it for power. They do favours in order that favours will be done to them in return. And it's certainly a world where men were, and women probably, were obsessed by what we would call face. They don't want to lose face. They would call it worship. Worship is respect. It's standing well with people. And you don't want to lose it. But it's also a vulnerable world. Fortune's wheel is turning quite wildly in the Wars of the Roses. And being useful, having friends, and having good lords mattered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Does anybody want to comment? <laughs> as long as it's nice. <laughs> There's, there's, there's yeah, hang on, hang on, we have Mr. Boone first. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a long dialogue here. Um, interesting your... Is it working? Um, we, uh, you mentioned Bosworth and John. John 2 and 3 fought at Barnet for Lancaster. John 3 was wounded? Yes. Yeah. Um, if the um, summons from Norfolk would be obeyed, John would then probably unwillingly fought for Richard. But there's no evidence. But John III fought for Henry VII at Stoke. So is the likelihood then that he avoided Bosworth because his Lancastrian sympathies remained. Did everybody hear the question? Good. Um, yes, I mean, that, that, that is perfectly likely. Um, we, we can't really see closely who turned up at Bosworth. I mean, the, the people who die there and the people who are attainted for their part in it, we can see the letters recruiting for Bosworth, um, well, sorry, let me start out again. Um, letters recruiting soldiers for use against the opposition to Richard went out very early. But the actual order to get them into the field went out very late. Um, and 
in fact, it, it is interesting that Norfolk and his son Surrey were there, um, and, and dying in Norfolk's case is, is proof of that. Um, I, I think a lot of people sat on their hands. Um, we, we have the lists of, of the people who were meant to organise the summons for each county. And there are oddities there. Um, or, or, or not oddities, there are questionable things, I think, uh, about some of it. But I'm not really here to talk about Richard III. <laughs> 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 oh. Oh, uh, Andrew Fakes, Yarmouth Archaeological Society. Um, how saintly were the uh, Pastons? I mean, were they any better or worse than the Haydens? Uh, um, or, uh, you know, we just got their side of the story, have we not? Uh, yes, we only have the Paston side of the story. Um, a, a local individual that the Pastons heartily loathed uh, and were loathed back was William Brandon. Um, and the Paston letters have some rather good, rude stories about Brandon. Or it's about the Brandon family. Um, one, and they're all called William Brandon, so it's a bit problematic. But one of the William Brandons, um, according to the Pastons anyway, first swived somebody's wife. And you know what swived means. And then swived the daughter. And people cried shame, apparently. Um, the Brandon was also, also embarrassed John too. I, I didn't copy this to, to share with you, but it, it's, it's a nice story. Um, while the Duchess of Norfolk was pregnant with her first child, um, John too, the courtier, said something to her that was meant to be very agreeable. But he misphrased it, evidently. Um, and Brandon was spreading the word that the things that John had remarked about the, the Duchess were, were really very iffy. Um, I can't remember all of them, but one of them was that John had said... Um, well, what, what John agreed, he said, was, was that he sort of praised her on, on her big body and said that there was, was, was room for the child to play in. Brandon reckoned that John said that, that there was room enough for the baby to go out at, which is not quite as appealing. Um, not quite sure how I got onto that, sorry. <laughs> Um, congratulations on a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm interested to understand how the Pastons became so successful so quickly. Now, I can see that the first generation was a very um, keen, hardworking and successful farmer. And he sent his son off to university and he became a very successful legal man but somehow they must have got money and land is it all through marriage or is it through um what the legal man got through winning his cases if you're a successful lawyer in the middle ages it is a great money spinner I mean, it, it really is. Um, I, I touched on this. The, the, the land law is so complicated. Well, it probably still is, for all I know, but it, it was a nightmare in the Middle Ages. And the, I mean, you can make straightforward money out of being a lawyer, but you can also make yourself some rather good land deals. Yeah. Um, which I'm, I'm sure William is doing. Um, and it also perhaps stands you in good stead to make good marriages. I mean, William made a good marriage, um, whereas his father had not been, you know, all, all that powerful. I think, I think they're clever. I think they're lucky. I think John, 
John the First works very, very hard at um, being sort of all things to all noblemen. Um, when you look at the um, edition of the Paston Letters that Norman Davis did, Norman Davis organised it not chronologically, but by letters to somebody and letters by somebody. So it's a nightmare to group the letters <laughs> in chronological order. But if you look at the John Wan section, letters to John Wan, just about, well, not everyone, but let's say one in two is somebody, ask, somebody powerful asking John to do something. So he has this enormous clientele of powerful men, noblemen in many cases, to whom he says yes and does it and does it well. And it, that is so important. I mean, even if they don't reward him in sort of hard land, hard money, knowledge that, I mean, that phrase in, at the end of my talk that I stumbled over, knowing that he is someone that powerful men will do for is just worth lots of money and land. Do you think the letters were ever written or maybe curated with a view to being more publicly, uh, widely circulated, or was it just a happy accident? I think... Um, I think as far as the ones we tend to be interested in, the family ones, um, it, it's been suggested by Norman Davis, the editor and others, that Margaret, it is Margaret who's the driving force for those family ones, and she's probably the person who makes sure her sons return letters that they receive to her and so on. Because the the collection really starts petering out after Margaret dies. It goes on a bit longer, but that's moving into rather more conventional, quasi-political, quasi-business letters. So Margaret has a big part in it. Um, and I imagine that we've sort of all known mothers like that, who save up the family letters. But a lot of the letters which are often regarded as less interesting, are kept for legal reasons. I mean, they're, they're evidence of stages in a law case or something like that. Another one. Um, the peerage in this period um, varied in terms of influence. As you rightly said, William... Um, Delapool went down to Suffolk and the Suffolk family lost influence thereafter. Um, Mowbray's went down um, by death. Howard was killed at Bosworth. Henry VII then chose to trust the peerage less after he had to execute Stanley. I don't think he ever trusted them to start with, well, actually. But, but do, do you think that John III was being one sort of step down, gained importance in that scenario because Yarmouth really lobbied him like fury to oh, get yes. to the king. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's right. And in many ways, even if we're talking about nobility losing national influence, they very rarely lose local influence. I mean, if you've got a, a nobleman on your doorstep, unless he's just been accused of treason, he's worth, worth lobbying. There's a question here. That one. Oh, um. I wanted to ask, what sort of people were employed in their families to actually, the, the people that they dictated their letters to? Um, predominantly... It's an interesting question. I, I could fudge the answer a bit by saying they're predominantly clerks. Because clerk, of course, has two senses. It can be a, a priest, it can be a cleric, or it can be somebody you know, who is active in administration and can write letters. Um, so I think it, it's probably 
I mean, again, this word servant is tricky because we then start thinking about, you know, waiting maids and things. Um, but a well-educated man, able to read and write, doing sort of even perhaps secretarial work, as we would say, in the household is the obvious person to, to go for. Um, because I mean, what, what's often forgotten about medieval writing, apart from people who've tried to do it, is, is that using a quill pen is an absolute nightmare. Um, calligraphers still use quill pens because it, they can produce brilliant, brilliant um, results. But for a, an ordinary person who doesn't write all that much, a quill is a very difficult way to, to do it. Um, and a lot of medieval handwriting is absolutely atrocious. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we tend to think reading and writing go together, but they just didn't in that period. And sort of a clerical training, uh, university training, would at least make sure that you could write tidily. And also that you had some idea of what you were talking about when, when you wrote. Any more? Yep. Um, may I ask, when the Bishop of Norwich was approached, what was his decision on the marriage? Oh, it was valid. Oh, okay. that, 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 that's why um, Margaret and Agnes go off the deep end. Um, no, you, you're quite right to query that because it's left Im implicit. Um, but the fact that Agnes and Margaret um, are appalled, no, he says it's fine. Good, yeah, nice bloke, clearly. <laughs> this one here. I have a particular interest in coming to your lecture because my maiden name is Paston. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> However, when I look at my family records, I notice that the male members of the family have the, the addition of, uh, for example, Stuart, no, it's um, Stuart Chambers Paston, right. so that the men have the additional surname but the women obviously don't matter and that still holds to this day what would chambers represent um i'm not as au fait on the brett as i should be um probably a marriage alliance at some point that wanted to be celebrated i mean if if paston is is the male line then the other one might well be a woman who brings a lot of land into the family, or, or vice versa. Um, or a sense, well, I mean, I, in, in one of the Maddingley courses I did on the Pastons, in fact, the last one, I was deeply disconcerted to find that I had, I think it's a Henry Beddingfield Paston sitting in the audience <laughs> because he thought it was time he learned a bit about the Pastons. Um, and it was quite it was quite fun, and he he, he brought along um, an absolutely massive um, family genealogy. I mean, it was post medieval, um, but I mean, he he was entirely upfront that the Pastons. I mean, the Pastons are you know in the dim and distant. I mean, really, they're bedding fields now, um, but they took over the past in name as a reminder that they got a lot of land, I think. Um, so any past in the surname would now be as a result of something that happened on the wrong side of the bank? Oh, no, 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 not necessarily. Uh, and in fact, I would have thought um, that didn't happen in the past in bedding fields. Um, I, think it's, I think it's recognition that from that other family has come a great deal of wealth, a great deal of land, a great deal of status. Um, and you want to keep the name as part of your name, to keep your sticky paws. I mean, I know it's symbolic rather than a legal practicality, um, but I think that's how it, how it works. Um, and I, you know, I mean, even in, in modern days, 
that can happen. Um, so. Hello, can I just make a point about the Paston Bedding Feld? Yeah, oh yes, I'm link. sorry, yes it is, um, I know. It was 1826 that Margaret Paston married Sir Henry, uh, they're all called Sir Henry, or whatever, and um, she brought a huge amount of wealth, and um, from my experience at Oxborough Hall, um, I've realised that this was the case. But um, she was supposed to have been the last of her particular branch of the Paston family, so that's why um, Sir Henry was very much a social climber. He actually yeah. took on the Grandison Bar Baron, he became Baron Grandison for his life because that was one of the many bedding fell things that the current Sir Henry was referring to. And um, we just felt that that was, that was why it became, it was from the Paston because of all the money which elevated the family, the Beddingfeld family. Yes, and it, it, and it helps um, I mean, I, I didn't say this myself, but you did. I mean, it, it helps if the f surname you've just chosen has actually died out in, in a significant sense. Okay. Um, yeah, hang on. <laughs> Would you suggest, then, that the continuation of the Paston name might well have been because some of the women of the Paston Married men who agreed to change their name. No, no, no. Um, not at that early stage. I think Matt has the last question. Can I get the last one? No. <laughs> um, obviously, the Pastons are the Paston letters are a fantastic resource, and you've spent a long time studying them in, in absolute detail. And. Um, the, the letters obviously give a hint of the characters of the Pastons themselves. So, final question before we break for refreshment. Do you like Pastons? <laughs> um, nobody could like Agnes. Agnes, Agnes is a cow. Um, um, I think... It is a good question. Um, Colin Richmond, of, of whom I'm very fond and who is an expert on the Pastons, um, his favourite is John II, which I found slightly odd. And I, I think John II sound... Well, I don't like playboys, so I, and John II sounds like a playboy. Not I, you, I, 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 it? <laughs> um, I... I like John III. He, he seems to me a, a good thing. Um, Marjorie Paston, I respect for, you know, sticking out and, and marrying Cal. Um, Margaret... Margaret can turn a bit nasty. I mean, I, I, what she says about her daughter, when her daughter marries Cal, is, is just horrible. Um, but, and, and she also, hmm, there, 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 there are times, I mean, John, John III had trouble with her because she, she, in her widowhood, she got very sort of dependent on her chaplain, James Gloys, and things like that. Um, but I, I think if I, if I had to, Pick one of the blokes, it would be John Three. Good choice. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rosemary. That, that was terrific. Uh